So let's get started. Um, our next session is a very special session, I would say. Um, it was in the ambition of this conference to create a space for participants with diverse professional backgrounds um, to engage with each other, to discuss um, the topics we are interested in. Um, we want to enable different ways to uh, communicate and discuss concepts of development beyond growth. Um, I'm not sure to what extent we managed to meet this ambition in all sessions, but I'm sure that this session will be really allow us to get to new and interesting and non-standard way of communicating uh, degrowth concepts. Um, it's such my other honor to, to introduce Celine Keller. Um, Celine is an artist who uh, makes illustrations uh, and comics on topics such as climate change, uh, social justice, ecological justice. Um, she has frequently collaborated with NGOs, with activists, and engaged in, in many uh, political struggles. Um, and today, Celine will present her graphic novel, Who's Afraid of Degrowth, to us, um, a book that, that uses a very creative and accessible way of communicating the ideas and conceptions of, of many degrowth theorists. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to your talk. Um, let's welcome Celine Keller. Um, thank you all for coming and thank you for inviting me to talk about who is afraid of degrowth. So uh, first of all, for those who haven't read it yet, um, it's free to download and I also brought hard copies, so I hope you will. Who is Afraid of Degrowth, um, stitches together quotes from all kinds of experts and public figures um, into a narrative that explains the most common misunderstandings and myths about degrowth. And it does that uh, in the form of a kind of graphic novel. Um, and I will now start with telling you about the reasons why I started this project, how I created the book, and the feedback I got. And I will finish with what I learned from it all and why I think there's a need for many more such projects and how you might help to make them happen. So let's start. As you can see on the cover of my book, um, debunking the myth about degrowth also involves debunking the myth about growth told by their biggest beneficiaries, Silicon Valley tech bro billionaires like Elon Musk. When I started this project now almost uh, four years ago, um, I wanted to create something practical that might help activists counter narratives that keep people from engaging with and understanding degrowth. And personally, I was super worried about the public not being aware that it's not only traditional climate change denial um, that stands in the way of the deep transformation necessary to avoid total climate, ecological and social meltdown, but that there are forces much more powerful than the fossil fuel industry which represent an even bigger threat to climate action. To be specific, Silicon Valley tech bro billionaires and their very weird ideas based on racism and eugenics. Quite a lot of these growth obsessed men believe in. And here we are, four years later, just when I thought that the world's richest man who for two decades had been hyped um, in the media and celebrated by politicians as our green growth climate savior, finally would fall from grace, a costly fall that took destroying one of the world's most important information infrastructures and turning it into his personal disinformation weapon, one he uses to incite violence, to promote neo-Nazis and to accelerate fossil fascism to support his maybe biggest lie, the promise of space colonization. So just when I thought we finally reached that tipping point, instead, Trump 
the seditionist, convicted felon, the rapist, won the US presidency once again. And Musk, instead of falling and landing in jail, is now the United States shadow president with a mandate to completely dismantle the administrative state. Yet, what remains confusing for a lot of people is how this human monster siding with Trump became the norm and not the exception. Because eight years ago, Peter Thiel caused a huge uproar for supporting Trump. And he was outed as an enemy of democracy. How come that today almost all of Silicon Valley VCs and tech billionaires who used to paint themselves as democratic and progressive leaders now openly backed and now celebrate Trump. Have you heard about the amount of money these tech billionaires have poured into the US elections? It's an amount that surpasses anything the fossil fuel industry has ever spent to achieve such feat. And they are spending it on both sides. This is um, US representative Katie Porter, who was attacked and defeated uh, by the crypto bros Fair Shake Super PAC, um, how she describes what they are doing. When you have members who are afraid of $10 million being spent overnight against them, the will in Washington to do what is right disappears pretty quickly. And is it common knowledge that even after Project 2025 was exposed as a detailed plan that would dismantle the US government and implement a fossil fuel driven theocracy under Trump, that Kevin Roberts, the president of the Heritage Foundation, the organization responsible for writing this plan and notorious for being a key member of the Climate Change Denial Atlas Network, that right after this absolutely terrifying revelation, Kevin Roberts was still allowed to speak not only at the New York Times Climate Week, but also at an important tech event in Silicon Valley. And it was like the week after. A conference where effective accelerationists met. A movement for which Mark Andreessen, another tech bro billionaire and incredibly influential uh, venture capitalist, wrote a manifesto, the Techno Optimist Manifesto. Um, on the right side, so you see a redaction poetry from Ben Grosser. You really should check out. He's one of my favorite artists right now. And, and working on degrowth. So the Techno Optimist Manifesto, uh, Mark Andreessen's Techno Optimist Manifesto, in which he not only celebrates growth as progress and hails growth as basically um, the solution to everything, but names a fascist as the movement's patron saint, while explicitly naming degrowth as the enemy. Another one of Mark Andreessen's patron saints uh, of effective accelerationism, Beth Jesus, explains that effectively accelerating means climbing the Kardashev scale. And the Kardashev scale, in case you didn't know, I didn't, the Kardashev scale ranks civilization, civilizations according to how much energy they are able to consume. Here's Beth Jesus saying that Eric Schmidt um, understands what effective accelerationism is all about, or as Jesus calls it, the thermodynamics of accelerationism. Let me read uh, for you what he was commenting on. Former Google CEO Eric Schmidt says energy demand for artificial intelligence is infinite and that we are never going to meet our climate goals anyway. So we may as well bet on building AI to solve the problem. 
This is techno-optimism in 2024. And as a side note, just like a recent report, I think last two weeks or something, just Oxfam, just found that the 50, 50 of the world's richest billionaires on average emit more carbon in just one and a half hours, I repeat, one and a half hours, than the average person in their entire lifetime. Mark Andreessen is also a big fan of anarcho-capitalist Javier Millet, or as his fans call him, General Ancap. Millet gets the thumbs up from pretty much the whole Silicon Valley bunch, and of course Trump. Um, there's uh, Sunda Piachai uh, from Google, M Sam Altman from OpenAI, uh, Tim Cook from Apple, of course Elon Musk, Trump, and Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook. And after a speech in Davos in January this year, Elon Musk called Millet hot. And I'm pretty sure he also enjoyed Millet discussing Europe's growth problem in Italy in April. Because in June, Musk predicted that Millet would bring massive growth to Argentina. That summer, this summer, Millet also visited Germany to receive an award from the Friedrich A. from Hayek Gesellschaft, an organization which is part of the Atlas Network. Remember Kevin Roberts, Project 2025, the president of the Hayek Gesellschaft in his Laudatio for Millet said, Millet is not a populist, but rather a popularizer of liberal market economy ideas. And what you can see on the right is uh, the Atlas Network's own magazine featuring Millet. And in September, just 10 months into the lions, as he likes to depict himself here fighting off rats and defending a deficit zero, 10 months into the lion's dystopian and violent reign, instead, Millet, with his austerity chainsaw, had turned Argentina into a country with a poverty rate of over 50%. And here's Kevin Roberts again, the man who wants to establish a fossil fuel theocracy not only in the US but around the world, commenting to Millet, glad to be in the fight with you, sir. Millet, the general ANCAP tech pros applaud those people whose innovations were supposed to save us, but who now scream that the only thing that could ever save us is comprehensive deregulation to maximize growth and energy consumption so we can climb the Kardashev scale. Stealing our work, draining our last water resources and polluting everything. Now also the knowledge sphere, with fake news and hallucinations dreamed up by a bloody mess they promise soon will turn into an all-knowing, all-saving AGI god, one they will have created. And Kevin Roberts, he wrote to Musk already in 2023 that he got just the plan to achieve those goals. Project 2025. Is your head already spinning? Your mind struggling with too much, too weird, too distressing information to make sense of, not to mention, to retain. That's how I feel almost every day since I started wondering why some of the richest men, and most powerful men on earth, feel threatened and attack a movement whose mascot is a little snail. And this feeling of being overwhelmed with information that nonetheless is necessary to understand what's going on in a public debate that is crucial for humanity's future in times of worsening poly crises that threaten everything. So that's one big reason why I created Who is Afraid of Degrowth. I wanted to understand why degrowth 
about which at that time I didn't knew all too much, or I didn't know all too much in the beginning, triggered so much online backlash whenever it, man uh, whenever it managed to appear in the media. Including from some actors I already knew from my previous work about climate change denial and earlier research into transhumanism. Transhumanism is a movement advocating for human enhancement through technology, and the tech bros have always been big fans of transhumanism. So I started reading, and when I do research, I always try to think about how to turn what I'm learning into something helpful for others. This is Timothy uh, Parikh, and yes, I'm super proud he liked my book. Because I watched Timothy over and over again debunk the same false claims about degrowth online. Claims that repeatedly came from what started to look to me like bad faith actors. People on top of it, sometimes seemingly from the left, always attacking, not really interested in any fruitful discussion, even after being offered piles of reading material. They would just come back a couple weeks later, repeating the same lies. But worst of all, other people seeing these online discussions as soon as those false claims got some likes and confirmed what they already believed to be true, those people weren't interested in learning about degrowth either. And as an online activist, I thought it would be awesome to have easily accessible and shareable material to counter those false claims and to give to people who might be just confused. Timothy um, has like a treasure trove of such material on his website, but it's mostly long form. And in the heat of the moment, I was rarely able to pull out the quotes and facts that I somehow remembered the gist of it, but never enough to share. The thing with online uh, uh, with social media or being on social media is you need short snippets of information with links to quality uh, sources uh, you can share to back up what you're saying and then to move on because it's wasted time and energy to discuss what might turn out to be a bot or just someone who wants to trigger you. Energy that should be now, that shouldn't be put into debunking, but in sharing and discussing positive ideas about how we, together, can change this climate-destroying and all-life-on-earth-threatening economic system. And this was on my mind um, when I saw a row of tweets uh, from Timothy summarizing the most common myths, uh, misunderstandings about degrowth. And he managed to summarize them in just a couple short sentences. And I thought, that's it. I'm just going, going to read a bit more, find the right quotes and figures to flesh out his statements, illustrating uh, what such misguided and bad faith attacks on degrowth might look like and how to counter them. Simple plan, a short, helpful comic featuring practical advice from experts. But when I drew these two first pages, I had no idea where this would take me or that this project would turn out uh, to be a book of 158 pages. As you can see, I started with a um, gas and oil lobbyist screaming, degrowth is an economic horror show, and Jason Hickel um, counters with recession is not degrowth and a pretty long debun debunking list. I thought it will take me a couple months, tops, maybe 28 pages uh, to get it all done. But instead, my desire to provide a short explainer of the misunderstandings about degrowth led me down what conspiracy theorists call a rabbit hole. Except it was a rabbit hole about a conspiracy that is out in the open and that we all know about. Decades of climate change denial, sowing doubt, 
funded by the same fossil fuel companies who all knew that the growth of their businesses would cause climate catastrophe. A denial that would not have been possible without the support of some very famous economists. And a denial that is still cloaked in tales of growth and progress, which are now spread by Silicon Valley tech bros. And there's simply no way to explain what is happening today without engaging um, with history as context, including uh, geopolitics and the far-right attacks on democracy globally. Attacks that include the right trying to build what in Germany we call a querfront, or as others call it, diagonalism or red-brown alliances. And that is complicated and takes time to explain. How many of you know about Lyndon LaRouche um, and his violent political cult? He was a fascist, the guy over there on the photo in the middle. Um, he was a fascist who started his political career as a Marxist and who attacked the limits of growth report in the 80s, right about the same time as he unveiled his own plans to colonize Mars. At that time, Elon Musk, who once also claimed to be a socialist, um, was still a teenager. Or who knows um, that the um, anti-Semitic conspiracy myth called cultural Marxism actually has roots in the LaRouche movement. This is what LaRouche once said on Marxism. It's my responsibility to make possible a capitalist solution, not because I'm pro-capitalist, but because that is the only thing that can ensure the survival of the human race. Therefore, I'm in the same position as Marx. Mind-bending, isn't it? <laughs> but this cult still exists and is quite active. And it has one of its headquarters right here in Germany promoting whatever Putin would like Germans to believe. So my project grew and grew in itself, a kind of nice debunking uh, of the false claim that degrowth is opposed to growth in general. It's not degrowth just wants people to be able to make informed decisions together democratically on what needs to degrow and maybe stop and what needs to grow for a healthy economy inside planetary boundaries that works not for profits, but for collective well-being and a socially just and livable future for all of humanity. And one thing I focused on but struggled with uh, during my uh, project was that I wanted to highlight voices from the Global South. Because I'm convinced, as I'm sure most degrowthers are, that to tell the stories that will enable us um, to start imagining and building a world beyond growth and capitalism, we first have to listen. Listen to the voices that have always been there, but were rarely listened to. I sample my quotes uh, mostly from news articles and Twitter. And Guess who rarely gets to speak in the media? Or who has to be much more careful in speaking out online because the backlash will be so much more severe. As Mira Ghani um, notes here, we have a lot of learning to do from indigenous leaders, but also from black, trans and queer communities because they all have been practicing community care like no other forever. Or, as I quote Jamie Tyberg here, um, throughout the hill communities of Southeast Asia, indigenous communities have been evading state capture and practicing sovereignties long before Westerners introduced the concept. These communities and their ways of living have persisted in resisting state violence <clears throat> while protecting and preserving 80% of existing global biodiversity. She explains that degrowth is an unlearning formula, 
consisting of care, autonomy, and sufficiency. One that is essential for understanding that the end goal for degrowth is, isn't degrowth, but decolonization. And it's no coincidence that the words and concepts like decolonization or critical race theory have become so controversial in times when growth and project progress means basically endlessly rising record numbers of billionaires and expecting the arrival of the first trillionaire in 2027. As Jason Hickel explains in this video, I recommend watching and I will quote him here for quite a bit. We have to be cognizant of the fact that the struggle for economic liberation in the South is fundamentally antithetical to the capitalist world economy. Because accumulation in the core depends utterly on the cheapening of labor and resources in the global South and it has for the past 500 years. Any attempt by liberation struggles in the periphery to achieve economic independence, to use their own resources for their own development, for their own ecological transition, for their own human needs, is destabilizing for capital in the core. And the situation in Palestine, right now, we have to understand, is not primarily a moral one. That's how we think about it. That is not how capital thinks about it. For them, it is a matter of suppressing and crushing liberation movements because a liberated Palestine means a liberated Middle East and a liberated Middle East means capitalism in the core really faces a crisis. And they will not let that happen. And they are unleashing the full violence of their extraordinary power to ensure that it doesn't. And it's also no coincidence either that the tech bro billionaires obsessed with growth are also profiteering from genocide. We've been watching live streamed on the social media platforms those same billionaires own. Or that any war is good for fossil fuels, uh, fossil fuel business, the bigger the better and very bad for achieving climate goals. So how to end this talk without leaving you all utterly depressed and feeling hope and helpless? I think everybody here understands that the times are extremely grim. But as Julia Steinberger screams into a megaphone, we already have all necessary tech to get us back into planetary boundaries and to provide a decent life for all. But despite this paper highlighted here being four years old about what to me clearly seems the only chance for a livable future on a peaceful earth, I have still to find an article in any major or even small news publication that talks about this. Probably because the first step to getting there involves abolishing the billionaires who seem to also own all the newspapers. <coughs> So what to do about this? And here we get to the point where I believe all of us can make a difference because giving up is simply not an option. This is a summary of how far the crowdfunded printed copies of Who is Afraid of Degrowth um, have traveled around the world. I can't tell you how many times and from where the free digital version has been downloaded because I don't track my website and although these numbers might seem like micros uh, like a microscopic small drop on an extremely hot stone especially when you know that billionaire funded atlas network has a whole army of recruits writing op-eds in newspapers and creating free educational material used in school curriculums all around the world Still, to me, this feels like having an impact and being less alone. Hearing from people around the world that the book made its way into their libraries and onto their university bookshelves, 
or that a psychologist used it to make degrowth a topic at a conference in Ireland, or that a famous architect and someone else I really admire ordered one too, that it traveled to so many places, even as far as Colombia, Singapore, India, Bahrain, and Dubai. It makes me feel like I'm part of something that might, against all odds, still make a difference. And that's important in, time, in times when a lot of people feel like no matter how much they protest, it has no impact at all on our political leaders. They seem not to care. Recently, um, I heard Eman Abdelhadi, a sociologist, make the point that feeling desperate and frustrated about having no impact at all might be the reason people on the left start attacking each other. Because the chance to get a reaction and to feel like having an impact compared to fighting a seemingly untouchable enemy is kind of bigger. But of course, that's utterly self-defeating and it really has to stop. One Italian student told me that she loved the book because terrifying stuff was packaged with a bit of humor, but that most importantly, it made her feel like that someone like her, too scared to take more risky actions, could find different ways to contribute to be part of the struggle. I told her I'm a bit of a coward too, one who deeply admires all those brave activists courageously taking direct action, but that I myself am terrified too of police and violence. But yes, that I believe that even cowards can and must play an important part. That really everyone has some special gift, has some special gift, something humanity needs to build the global community capable of changing everything by caring everyone for everyone. But that the way we are raised and the societies we live in make it very hard to find our places. We are all indoctrinated to compete and so most people end up feeling insecure. Not only regarding how to make a living, but insecure about ourselves and each other. I don't know anyone who doesn't crave a little bit more attention and care and to be seen as valuable, or seen at all. Seen despite not being the best, not standing on the upper part of the ladder, or even the top. And I'm also convinced that's why working together and creating that community might feel like a lot of work, work and kind of hard. Because being recognized and valued for the whole universe that you are is awfully scarce in our competition-based societies. We are trained to compare ourselves and rank each other. And even movements can break apart over fighting about what's the best and most effective action to take now and who's going to take it recreating the very conditions that many of us want so desperately to overcome. So finally, here's my secret, or how I found something to contribute despite all the hurt, frustration and doubts, and how I tricked myself into being able to follow my project through. I combined what I feel is a lack in myself, but for which I found a fix that I think might be useful for others too, with something else I'm really not great at, but which makes me feel good and that I love doing. And I put that combination to work for something bigger than myself. And then I gave myself permission to really do it. And whenever doubt crept up, I told myself I'm allowed. This is important and I do it to support and protect others. The lack is that I have a weird kind of memory. I do remember an awful lot, but not in a way I can easily express in words or in face-to-face -face conversations.
I need my monster threats on Twitter, where I collect information and hoard my links. Plus, I use the search, search function uh, quite a bit. The thing I love is drawing. And honestly, I'm not great at it. I make photo collages and draw on top. But I love it. It keeps me going. And I'm pretty sure for all that's happening, for all that's coming, and the almost unimaginable we have to achieve together, this transformation of a whole world system, now increasingly under fascism, for that to happen, I believe it will be kind of essential that each and everyone finds something that they love doing and a way to transform it into something to help bring about that change. Whatever that might be, because I believe it really can be anything. Anything that helps you to get out of bed in the morning and that can be turned, however creatively, into using it to protect and support others. And as long as you keep trying and learning from it, you can and will be part, not only of imagining, but making a revolution. Free Palestine. Thank you. Thank you, Celine, for the presentation. Um, you also brought a few copies no, so that can be purchased later on yes, um, with the authors and you are also approachable later on in the dinner break for more questions and comments. But we do have a few minutes for uh, a few reactions, a um, few questions you would like to pose to the author. Um, is there anyone who wants to know anything? Michael. Yeah, it's working. First of all, thanks a million for this beautiful presentation. And also thanks for highlighting all the craziness that has happened in the last few days that this conference was shielding us from, I think, a bit, uh, being in this parallel world. Um, I was just wondering how long has it all took to create this book? And uh, like, because you're saying it has been a long process for you to find something you're maybe particularly not great at, but then went into it. So when did it all start? It was um, kind of uh, crazy. I think like, like the last year I was just like uh, uh, doing the crowdfunding and sending the books away. But before that, I would say it took me with research and everything, two and a half years. But in those three years, I also made another one about the trade deals, about the energy charter treaty, which was super urgent at that moment. So it was a very, I don't know, chaotic time with lots of, uh, with lots of, um, lots of stuff. But I think that's something else maybe uh, worth sharing. I didn't make a complete plan. I, I work like this. I, I took Timothy's uh, um, really like a, like a short, small skeleton and built on that without knowing where it's going to take me. And, uh, um, and that also, for me, it helps to, to, to do a project because I, if I want to do it the normal way, you know, like have everything ready and then start drawing, I think I would not get there. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much. Also, I looked at the book, uh, I really uh, liked it. And uh, you presented here this, uh, the external enemies. Okay? Yes. But you studied the issue for so long and so deep. And so if you can just comment on uh, uh, the internal reason why... Uh, the growth has been so misunderstood. If, uh, so what are the internal weaknesses, uh, what, in, in your opinion? What, what, what the internal weaknesses are? Actually, yeah, so, I... So, I, I mean, I cannot, I cannot believe that everything is uh, 
uh, due to the enemies. No, there oh, must no. be something wrong in the narrative, in the in the discourse that the, the growth community I actually, did along with all these years. And what is your opinion about that? Well, of course, uh, also in this environment of constant attack and. Uh, uh, there are uh, mistakes that are made, but actually it, it, I got into this pro uh, um, project because I got really kind of super agitated and angry about watching all these super sweet degrowthers really trying to be sweet to these people and having discussions with them and trying to, you know, like being really open and doing it again and again. It just made me mad. And, 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 and because it, to me, it looked like, and I, I'm pretty sure, like after doing all that research, that it's not a coincidence. And of course, degrowth isn't perfect, you know, but um, like for all the trying that's in there and actually, you know, like all the books I read and how deeply the people actually try to reflect and learn from their errors, I find it absolute. I don't know, enraging <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, the attacks that are launched against it. Meanwhile, other things don't get like, like a, a tenth of the um, negative attention, let's say, you know. And actually, I do, I learned a lot too, you know, like uh, in the beginning, I also thought like, oh yeah, maybe it's true, maybe that's a bad word, maybe we shouldn't, you know, like, but the deeper I got into the into the uh, uh, um, into the reading, I did understand why um, why, for example, uh, people cling to that uh, uh, cling to that uh, uh, to that word, because as you see, all these years, all these attacks later, they weren't able to occupy it or to capture it. That's such a goal. That's just you know, like everything else get uh, gets captured without problems, and that one wasn't able to be captured, and that's actually pretty cool. <laughs> Good. Thank you, Celine. Um, thanks for your presentation. Thanks Thank for you. being with us. Daniela is actually leaving. <laughs> <laughs>